Okay, so uh, what we're talking about today, um, and this is a very interesting topic, uh, and um, and it's not one that I talk about very often, but but it is one I think about, uh, and uh, it's the uh, shifting right boundary uh, between science and science fiction. Um, and uh, the first thing I want to say about that is um, that that there is a very misleading way of characterizing this, and I think it's a it's a misleading way that that is quite prominent nowadays, um, which makes it seem as though in the beginning there was science, and then somehow science fiction is something on the back of it. Okay, uh, and and I would say that that is uh, that is the wrong way to look at the matter. Uh, historically, um, and in fact, I think a much uh, a much better way of looking at it uh, is in terms of thinking about the idea of science and science fiction as something uh, that has been uh, co-created, right? So, in other words, they both come into existence at the same time, because part of what science is about, and you know, generally speaking, we know about science as kind of the systematic you know, pursuit of, of, of truth by the most rigorous methodological means, right, which has to do with uh, observation and calculation and measurement, right, and um, various kinds of theorizations and testing of the theories, right? We know what science is in that general kind of sense, but that sort of uh, idea, in a way, was co-created with what we now call science fiction, because science fiction has a lot of those aspects as well. And I think the best way to see what I'm talking about here is by going back to uh, the period that in the West we call the Renaissance, right? Uh, and uh, the Renaissance is basically a period where, um, in a way, uh, you might say uh, Western culture, which for the previous, whatever, 1500 years, had been very much uh, dominated by various depending on what part of Europe you were, you were in, uh, various kinds of uh, Christian orthodoxies. Um, and, um, and what the Renaissance, as the word is French and it means rebirth, uh, it was a kind of rebooting of, of what the human condition was, right? So there was a tendency in this period to kind of think about things from scratch, to challenge established authorities and traditions and stuff like that. And it's out of this period uh, that we start to get this kind of co-creation of science and science fiction. Now, one of the things you would look at at the beginning, uh, you know, in the direction of science fiction, but it gives you a sense of sort of where the direction of travel is going, is a book by Thomas Moore called Utopia. Some of you may have run across it. Um, so this book is published in 1516, uh, and uh, it's a very important kind of book. Uh, it's... Uh, it's 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 a book that uh, in in many respects uh, um, anticipates a lot of the sort of utopian thinking uh, that we see uh, these days uh, in terms of imagining a different kind of society, a different kind of you know, and and more is thinking about this kind of society as basically organized as a city, um, but uh, you know, and, and utopias have this kind of character to it, right? And utopia literally means nowhere in Greek. Uh, and in a sense, uh, the utopia is somewhere other than here, right? So that's one of the implications. And it's not only somewhere other than here in space, but somewhere other than here in time. Um, and that's another feature about this. And I want, and that's a very important part of the kind of science fiction mentality that utopia already shows, um, and that and that is the future orientation, right? That we're talking about uh, something in the future. Now, why are we talking about the future in this context? Well, first of all, the future hasn't happened yet. It's not there, um, but it will happen. Um, and and so, you know, in a sense, that's interesting, right? Because if you if you put a lot of, as it were, the force of what you're trying to talk about in terms of telling stories or making arguments, uh, you know, and you say the future is what I'm talking about, right? There's a sense in which uh, you immediately, uh, you know, put yourself in a position where at least in principle, you could be talking about something radically different from what has been happening in the past and what has been happening historically in your own society and other societies and so forth. 
And so one of the things that you know people who who look at the philosophy of history, for example, uh, will will notice about this kind of turn of mind that leads to something like Thomas More's Utopia. Um, is that it breaks with a kind of conception of time that was very much present, certainly in classical Western culture, right? And that's the idea of cyclical time, which is the idea that, you know, whatever's happened in the past will happen again in the future, only in a different kind of way, but it'll be pretty much the same thing, right? And there's no sense of a radical break. Now, uh, this idea gets challenged, obviously, during the Renaissance, and utopia is an interesting way of challenging it because I would say it's a relatively conservative challenge. Because if you look at Thomas More's Utopia, um, it is basically a book that, that sees this kind of ideal society as basically the best parts of already existing societies. Right. So so it's basically you, you might say it's a kind of an inventory of everything that seems to have worked in all the different societies that, you know, people in the 16th century would have known about in Europe um, and, and then putting them together, stitching them together in some way. In, in this respect, Thomas More's Utopia is a little bit at the conceptual level, a bit like the island of Dr. Moreau from H.G. Wells, which I believe you, you've read, right, And in the way in which the doctor operates, because what the doctor is doing there is he's stitching together what he regards as kind of the best bits of different animals to come up with new, you know, uh, creatures that are in fact better than the originals of which they were composed, right? This is the theory, at least, in Dr. Moreau's mind. Well, this is also the theory uh, that is in Thomas More's Utopia, right? That if you take the best of all of the different societies that have existed and put them together in one place, that you will, in fact, get Utopia. Now, you know, here's the thing, of course. Uh, it's not as, you know, as, as Dr. Moreau, in a way, you know, the novel uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau illustrates very well, this is easier said than done. And there are all kinds of costs and it has a lot of consequences that go way beyond what you're intending to do, okay? And in that respect, Thomas More's Utopia uh, doesn't really confront that, right? And, and, and in a sense, Thomas More's Utopia, in a way, sets also a kind of precedent for people thinking uh, that utopian fiction, if you want to call it that, right, um, in a way is a, a little irresponsible, right, in the sense that you never get a sense of how this kind of society can maintain itself exactly, how does it come into being, what are the costs, right, that there's not enough of that that's being explicated, right, and so that when you get to the 20th century, let's say, and people are in a way revisiting the genre of utopia, right? We end up getting this thing called dystopia, right? Uh, and and there are many examples which I'm sure you're familiar with. One of them is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, which I'll have more to say about uh, in a few minutes, right? Uh, because Aldous Huxley is the brother of Julian Huxley, who wrote the short story, The Tissue King, uh, which uh, which I asked you to to look at. Um, so so that's an interesting point there. But that's a great dystopian novel, right? Where in a sense, uh, it's a novel which which in a sense does, on the one hand, try to put together what is regarded as the the things that ought to be taken forward in the future and enhanced. But it also takes quite serious account of all the costs, right? That the people have to bear in the process of this radical transformation occurring. And of course, you know, we can think about George Orwell's 1984, right? That's another novel that's sort of in that vein. Okay, so um, the thing about, um, about utopias, right, which in a way initially gave them their sort of bad reputation was the fact that they weren't costed, right? They weren't kind of being dealt with, um, you know, responsibly. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, this is why after a while people started to sour on that. Um, but, but uh, perhaps something a little, that, a little closer, uh, to the, um, to the realm of science fiction as we normally understand it, um, is, is a, it's a person who, um, lived in the century after Thomas More, uh, and, and was also, um, Thomas More, as you may know, was the uh, the Lord Chancellor under Henry VIII, uh, the King Henry VIII, of, who broke away from the Catholic Church in England, um, and, and he was eventually executed by Henry VIII. Um, well, Francis Bacon, who lives a century after 
uh, Thomas More is also Lord Chancellor, but this time to James I, um, who is an also an, 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 an equally, uh, even perhaps more important, a king in the United Kingdom, um, because he is the one who uh, authorizes the first English translation of the Bible, um, and, and otherwise was quite a supportive person with regard to the arts and sciences, uh, and this is the period when Shakespeare, for example, is flourishing, okay? So Francis Bacon is part of that scene, um, and he uh, is a person who we now think about uh, in, uh, in today's world uh, as a, the founder of the scientific method, right? Because he is the guy who uh, wrote this book uh, called The Novum Organum, right, uh, which means in Latin, new instrument, right? And basically what the new instrument is, is experimentation, right? Which is to say that from now on, when we seek knowledge, we are not just going to be relying on trusted authorities from the past, blah, 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 but rather we are going to test the claims experimentally, okay? So this is Francis Bacon. Now, Francis Bacon believed uh, that in order for, that this was a very powerful way of getting knowledge, but not only a powerful way of getting knowledge, but a powerful way of transforming to society to, as we would now say, though, though, though this turn of phrase perhaps wasn't so familiar in the 17th century, modernize, right? Uh, so it was about modernizing. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, if you're going to have new knowledge based on new foundations, that are experimentally tested, this is going to enable you to create a new society. And so Francis Bacon, you know, wrote about what he called the New Atlantis. Now, the New Atlantis is this kind of, it's a, you know, he presents it a kind of mythical society, but it's one where all of this kind of science and so forth, um, you know, is actually being realized and it's a kind of glorious future, right? Uh, and, um, and, and this sets a precedent, I think, um, for a certain kind of way in which science fiction gets off the, the ground, namely that there is a sense in which the future is a better place, right? The future is a better place and people will be doing things differently. And in a sense, though, the sorts of things people will be doing will be things that we can already see the elements of in our time. Right. And I think Francis. So Francis Bacon is the founder of the scientific method. But if you read his works, especially his later works, you know, you, if you had to make a judgment call on what the genre is of what he's writing. Right. It, you, you would say it's kind of science fiction. OK. Um, and, and so this is the 17th century style of doing business. Right. Um, and. Um, and and this kind of idea, right, right. So so what then becomes the difference between science and science fiction? Well, um, what increasingly happens over the the next couple of hundred years, uh, as science uh, becomes more established, right, as this kind of way of pursuing knowledge that Bacon is talking about starts to get a greater institutional foothold in the West, um, right, th th then science in a way. Uh, starts to draw its own boundaries, right? Uh, and so the ability of theories to be testable, right? The testability of theories becomes increasingly important. And that then does sort of draw a line between certain kinds of knowledge claims, which can be tested, right? Um, and those that cannot. And testability, I should say, is also tied to another issue that, that becomes very important in science, and that is publicity, right? So in other words, you have to be able to see it. It's not just me telling you, I did this experiment, you know, and wonderful things happen. No, you have to be able to see it for yourself. You have to be able to see my experiment. You have to even be able to reproduce my experiment to see that what I have done, in fact, has been done. OK, so all of that becomes part of science. And it's when you start to get those kinds of norms introduced into science. Right. And this then becomes part of the way in which people are professionally trained as scientists. And by the way, I think it's always worth keeping in mind that the word scientist to name the profession of someone who does science for a living only comes into existence in the 1830s. OK, 
Um, most people who were pursuing science prior to the 1830s uh, were, were, were trained in, you know, maybe mathematics or classics or, you know, theology or whatever, right? The, the, the existing uh, subjects of the university. They were not being trained in physics or biology or chemistry or engineering or all these things. They didn't exist, really, uh, as academic subjects in the proper sense. Right. So, so, so the idea of having a professional kind of idea of science becomes very important uh, in terms of making the distinction between science and science fiction. So what's science fiction then? Well, science fiction is, is that stuff that lies, lies outside, but is in some sense, um, you know, science relevant, right? Science oriented. And of course, um, where the science fiction authors can take the greatest liberty, right, is, again, when we're talking about the future, right? Because one of the things um, that, that uh, you know, people who, uh, so by the time we have science in the 19th century, let's say, where we have professional scientists, we start to also have history of science, right? And people start to have a kind of view about how science is developed, um, and, and one of the things that you learn about the history of science, and, and this was true even in the 19th century, uh, was that scientific theories come and go. They change. They get refuted, right? What people believe in science in one generation may be overturned in the next. And in fact, this becomes increasingly obvious as the 19th century goes on. And of course, the 20th century has been full of right, of 19th century theories that have been overturned massively, right? And, and, and so this idea that the future of science will be different from the present of science is something that, in a way, makes science fiction very salient, very relevant uh, from a cultural standpoint, because you start to get the sense that, that science fiction might be telling you what's going to happen. It might be really, you know, that, that in a sense, it might not be right on all the details. It might not be able to explain in any kind of fine-grained manner um, how the, you know, amazing stuff gets done. Uh, but nevertheless, it might get, you know, it gives you a kind of direction of travel. And there is no doubt, right? And this is especially true among the scientists in the 20th century, right? So the scientists in the 20th century, especially the second half of the 20th century, Right, have already been living with quite a lot of science fiction being published. And you, you very often find when these scientists start talking about what influences them, um, that, that they, uh, they refer to science fiction. Right? Uh, and, and of course, you know, when you think about science fiction, we can't just think about the novels of science fiction, but of course the films of science fiction. Um, and, and the films very often provide an enormous amount of vividness that actually does animate the scientific imagination. So I think we should not underestimate the extent to which science fiction, both in its literary and its filmic form, uh, influenced the way science works, right? Because science, in a way, is about overturning established authority, overturning what is believed today. And so, in a sense, it's always reaching out for the next frontier. And science fiction is very good at in a sense, portraying what that next frontier might be. Okay, so um, I think this really does need to be taken into account uh, when one thinks about the significance of science fiction. But here's an interesting thing. Um, let's say we, you know, even if we're going, so you think about H.G. Wells, right? So we got H.G. Wells here. And H.G. Wells, I think, is fairly regarded you, you might say, as, you know, the, the man when it comes to science fiction, right? That this is the guy who really put it on the map. Um, I mean, he didn't necessarily use the term, uh, but, but really, as it were, established it as a kind of genre that was recognizable and, and distinct from other forms of novels and, 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 and literary, uh, literary forms. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and that was recognized in his lifetime. Um, and, and I think he's a very interesting character. And this is why I'm glad you guys have been reading the Island of Dr. Moreau. Um, because, uh, Wells himself is someone who in a way straddles very much this science, science fiction distinction. Okay. Um, of course, nobody would claim that he was a professional scientist, 
But nevertheless, um, the man was taken very seriously. I, I mean, and perhaps it's it's not so obvious today because when you read his novels, in a way, perhaps because <laughs> they have become so familiar in a way, the plot style and so forth have become so familiar because they've been imitated so many times uh, that we underestimate the extent to which, um, you know, uh, Wells's originality, you might say, uh, and and the extent to which people um, took him seriously. Okay, uh, so for example, uh, right off the bat, I'm thinking now, um, if you look at um, uh, so Winston Churchill, right, the uh, the uh, UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the one who led the country um, during the war, World War II, right. Um, he was also uh, a historian and a literary figure as well, a journalist, right? I mean, he he was uh, so he you know he wasn't just a politician. Um, and uh, when he he wrote an article uh, in the 1920s um, about the possibility of there being a nuclear war in the future, and this caught a lot of people's attention. Okay, so Winston Churchill writes this article in the 1920s, right after World War One. Right. I mean, um, people were just at that time, people were, you know, the physicists were just beginning to get a sense of what the uh, composition of the atom was. Right. But here's Winston Churchill saying that an enormous amount of energy could be released from the atom and this can lead to enormous amount of destruction in the future. OK, where did he get this idea from? He got it from a, a novel by H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells Right, having been following the developments in physics and so forth, in one of his novels, actually comes up with this idea. And Winston Churchill read it, and he thought this is something for defense analysts and other people to get serious about now, because it might well happen. Okay, so this is like 15 years before World War II. Okay? Um... Now, uh, so that's an example, right, of where H.G. Wells was taken very seriously. Now, H.G. Wells, um, as it turns out, was trained as a, as a biologist. So he has scientific training. Uh, and in fact, his, his teacher at uh, what, was, what became uh, Imperial College London, which is the main uh, science-based institution in the United Kingdom, um, it was in its early days, and Wells was one of its first students. Uh, and, and so we're talking about, you know, the 1880s, right? 1880s. Uh, and, um, and his teacher uh, was one Thomas Henry Huxley, right? Uh, and, and Thomas Henry Huxley, very famous as a defender of Darwin uh, and, and a, a professional surgeon uh, and, and someone who was, as a professional surgeon, was actually very much interested in vivisection. He was, in fact, one of the great champions of vivisection. So vivisection, as you know, probably from reading Dr. Moreau, right? So vivisection um, is this idea that you cut up animals um, basically to uh, find out stuff that might be helpful for human beings, right? I mean, it's kind of like animal experimentation, basically. It's just another word for animal experimentation, where in some sense the animals have to be dismembered right, in order to do stuff that will then provide benefits for understanding how uh, human beings operate. Uh, and, um, and of course, one finds out stuff about how the animals work as well, right? So, the, you know, it's, it's that too, right? Because uh, there's a sense in which if you really want to understand how animals work, right, especially if we're talking about the late 19th century, right? So we don't have the kinds of uh, x-ray technologies yet or any of these more less these less invasive kinds of ways of finding out what what's inside the creatures um you know that you basically have to cut them up uh and 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 of course you could cut up dead ones uh but but the dead ones may have been decayed and 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 so forth so you often have to cut up live ones uh and um and so uh, this is Thomas Henry Huxley defended this practice uh, and uh, Charles Darwin himself uh, was very uh, so so on it. He he really didn't think that it would actually provide as much benefit as Huxley thought, and he thought it would end up leading to unnecessary uh, pain and suffering on the part of the animals who were dismembered. Um, and and of course you can see this this kind of debate you might say between Huxley and Darwin playing itself out in the island of Doctor Moreau. 
uh, right? Because the, the, the one of the things about the novel, I would say, right, it's it's very graphic with regard to the uh, uh, portrayal of the suffering of these various creatures who get brought into being. Um, so so this is a uh, so this is H. G. Wells, right? So H. G. Wells uh, has this kind of background already. Um, and, and it really, you know, makes him think about stuff. Now, here's the other thing too about H.G. Wells. Uh, and this comes out, I think also clearly in the, the Tissue King novel by, uh, Julian Huxley, right? So we got Julian Huxley here, uh, and his novel is The Tissue King, right? Is this idea that, um, the reason why ultimately that you're cutting up these animals and you're doing all this kind of crazy experiments, right, is because you're trying to benefit society, right? So there's a kind of social goal here uh, that is, that is, it's not just a hobby, it's not just for fun, uh, that this is serious business. And in a sense, this is the way in which you kind of, uh, you know, push the envelope of the human condition, right? Uh, you know, in a sense, this is where we really prove who we really are by being able to take control of the processes of nature, right, and be able to shape them, you know, to our own designs, right? This is the, the idea, the idea that's shared, right, in both the Tissue King and the uh, Island of Dr. Moreau novels. Um, and, and this is obviously something that is very much part of the, um, you might say, vanguardist progressive mindset of the, uh, of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and, and, and Wells is wrestling with this, right? Now, one place where he wrestles with this, which is kind of interesting, um, uh, and again, you probably don't know this, but um, H.G. Wells put himself forward in 1907 to be the first chair of sociology at the London School of Economics. Okay? So he put himself forward as a candidate. Uh, and uh, he didn't get it, obviously. But but the interesting thing was the kind of pitch that he made uh, to, uh, you know, to say why he should be considered. Because, again, you, you have to think about it. You know, you, you're in the early 20th century. You got this guy, H.G. Wells, right, who's writing stuff like War, you know, War of the Worlds and, you know, uh, and, and, and Dr. Moreau. It was already published by then. Uh, and and uh, and you're kind of wondering what what what. What is this guy? Right, right. What, what, what field is he in? What, what? He's not like a conventional novelist, right? Because a conventional novelist would be much more talking about, you know, people's inner feelings, and, and actually spend a lot of time talking about very mundane stuff, but in, but in very inter psychologically interesting ways, right? I mean, um, there are a lot of novelists of that sort in the nineteenth century, right? Um, you know, but but Wells is doing something different. Characters are often not so uh, well uh, drawn. Um, you know, some of the action is uh, is a bit obvious, but there always seem to be these kinds of ideas that are sort of driving the plot, right? Uh, these kind of big ideas which have a kind of you know that kind of resonate with things that we're already thinking about now in science and could well be projected into the future. And so it was with this in mind that H.G. Uh, Wells uh, put himself forward as the uh, chair of sociology, because here's the way he thought about sociology. And again, sociology is a field that in 1907 didn't really exist in the UK. OK, I mean, it was already beginning to exist in France and Germany, um, but, but it didn't really exist in the UK. And so this is, in a way, the moment where it was sort of invented. Um, and so then the question becomes, what is this sociology going to be? Uh, and, and of course, uh, what, what Wells did was he said, sociology is about the future of society. Okay. Um, and what, you know, and where did he get that from? Well, um, in the introduction to me, um, it was said that, uh, I hold this uh, chair, Auguste Comte. Auguste Comte is the man who founded sociology and his view of sociology uh, was exactly this, what Wells was talking about. In other words, sociology was basically the science of the future society. And what it would be, it would be the culmination of all the knowledge that human beings had gathered over the centuries and through refinement and improvement, right? So he's imagining science, natural science kind of being in the lead of this, 
right then all being applied to society to rationalize and modernize society, right, so, so, so that the human condition can be taken to the next level. This was Auguste Comte's view of sociology. Uh, and, and it was part of a kind of a social movement uh, that was, you know, kind of big in the 19th century. Um, and in fact, uh, its motto was uh, order and progress. And you could still see that motto in the flag of Brazil, of all places, because this was very influential in Latin America. Um, now, so that's one precedent that, 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 that Wells is relying on. Uh, and another one, of course, would be people like Marx. Karl Marx, of course, was of the same kind of futuristic kind of mentality. Um, and also Herbert Spencer. So Herbert Spencer uh, was an evolutionary uh, thinker uh, who was a contemporary of Darwin's. Uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, was the first actually to talk about survival of the fittest and things like that. Um, and he was someone who also had this kind of view about how, you know, or societies ought to be organized. And he imagined in the future that, that societies in a way would get rid of their sort of militaristic past and become much more like uh, free trade zones. That was kind of what he thought. Um, and he was very popular in the sort of liberal culture of the UK uh, in the late 19th century. And so these would be people who, uh, who Wells's audience would be familiar with. Uh, and, and Wells was presenting himself kind of in that mold, right, as, one of, as, a, as a kind of forward-looking social scientist. Now, he didn't get the chair. Uh, and, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, my guess is part of it was, uh, he, he was seen as a very controversial figure and, and one of the areas in which he was quite controversial, uh, and this applies also to, uh, Julian Huxley, uh, is the issue of eugenics. Okay. Um, and so various aspects of eugenics, uh, you know, so when we say eugenics, what we're talking about is the idea of uh, selectively breeding uh, human beings for purposes of improving um, the stock, you might say, of humanity. So in other words, it's very much uh, in the spirit of uh, animal and plant husbandry, if you're familiar with that, right, where you, you, you breed the animals and you breed the plants, right, to, so they have greater yield, right, they provide more, more food possibilities, right, stuff like that. Uh, and eugenics was basically taking the same kinds of ideas and applying them to uh, human beings. Um, and uh, this idea really started to take off because you think about it, right? Um, even when you're looking at something like the island of Dr. Moreau, right, it's quite clear that, that Dr. Moreau uh, is trying to uh, create improved creatures, uh, but then the question becomes, uh, you know, how is he going to do it biologically? And, 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 and he basically uses what, you know, you might uh, sort of the technique, the Frankenstein technique, sort of, so to speak, where you actually take parts, right, of the creatures and you stitch them together kind of thing. Um, but of course, as uh, genetics comes on stage, right, in the late 19th century, people start to get a greater, more fine-grained understanding of the genetic mechanisms and the cellular mechanisms that are responsible for making the tissues and making the organisms and so forth, um, right? People then say, well, look, you don't have to be so crass about this, right? That you could do this, you know, at a, at a more micro level. Uh, and then you can think about the issue differently. You don't have to think about it purely in surgical terms. You could think about it perhaps in breeding terms. Nowadays, of course, with CRISPR technology and all these other kind of biotechnological sort of enhancements that are available, right, one can think about, inter, you know, more, you know, germline interventions, right? But, but you have to basically think that if, you, if you're talking about trying to improve right, the uh, human biology in some way, you know, you're kind of stuck with the sort of um, science and technology that you've got at your time. And that's going to end up determining how you think this, you know, this uh, kind of uh, improvement is going to occur. And that's why the Dr. Moreau stuff, you know, in a way looks very uh, crude, uh, 
right? But nevertheless, that was really all uh, these people these people could work with at the time, right? And to a certain extent, that's also true uh, in uh, the Tissue King as well, though by the time we get to the 1920s, right, the, uh, the, the Tissue King, right, is written 30 years after uh, the island of Dr. Moreau. Uh, you're already beginning to get more sophisticated biology on stream um, with regard to, for example, identifying genes and chromosomes and stuff like that, right? So you're you're actually being a, you're you're getting some more advanced knowledge by the time you get to Julian Huxley, and all of that ends up getting reflected in the science fiction, right? So as the science moves on, the science fiction improves, you might say, right? Uh, and um, and and so um, this is something, nevertheless, that's a big preoccupation of uh, of Wells eugenics. Um, and as well as uh, as Julian Huxley, right? Uh, and um, I, I, I want to make a remark about eugenics before going further and talking about the Wells and Huxley relation, which is a quite an interesting one. Um, and and that's because, um, as you know, eugenics is very is, remains a very controversial topic today, um, and and it's often seen uh, as racist, and and um, and in a way it certainly has been. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think one of the things that I would recommend to you uh, in order to see eugenics kind of in the round, what it, what, what it was, is I recommend the following. I recommend you have a look at the Oxford Handbook of the History of Eugenics. Okay? Um, the Oxford Handbook of the History of Eugenics. Because one of the things that you will find in there is that virtually every country in the world practiced eugenics. Now, and what I mean, right? I, I mean every country. I don't just mean European countries. I don't just mean America. I mean, you know, every, Asian countries, African countries, Latin America. Uh, now, you think about the, the racial spread that we're talking about here, right? Uh, so what's going on? Well, what is going on, uh, and, and, and I think this is the way to think about eugenics and why people like, H.G. Wells and Julian Huxley were very much attracted to it, was that, look, eugenics at the end of the day is basically how do you improve the biological stock of people, right? Just like we're interested in trying to improve people's skills capacity. We want to improve their education. We want to improve their nutrition. We want to improve their diet, right? Well, why can't we also improve, right, the genetic material that they start with? I think this is the spirit in which to look at eugenics, and this is why eugenics was very, historically, until we get to Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, right, uh, eugenics was largely seen as a progressive left-wing movement. Um, and nowadays, the people who are promoting, you know, uh, these kind of genetic technologies, you know, the reverse aging to end Alzheimer's, whatever, right, uh, they also are presented as progressive technologies. But the interesting thing is that every society that has pursued eugenics over the 20th century did it in the image and likeness of their society. So in other words, you know, if you're talking about a society that thinks of itself as a white society, then the eugenics is white. But if you think about it yourself as, as a society that, that is brown or black or yellow or whatever, uh, then it's in that image. And in fact, what you also find is that there uh, are societies, uh, and, and, and there's Mexico uh, and Malaysia, for example, which both of which had eugenics programs, but they were talking about a cosmic race, which is a mixed race. They were celebrating mixture because these places are mixed, okay? So you have all kinds of eugenics, okay? Um, and and uh, this is what I think was part of the idea, right? That in some sense that you could improve the stock of your people. And then, and, and I think it's really clear in the case of the Julian Huxley Tissue King book uh, that, that, that the whole motivation for getting into this tissue business, uh, right, is to solidify, to consolidate the uh, society, right? And that is very much a kind of, the eugenics way of looking at things. Um, and, um, and of course, this ended up having enormous amount of consequences in all kinds of ways. So, um, so for example, uh, contemporary policies with regard to things like abortion, 
and you know contraception um, are very closely tied to the eugenics movement historically. Okay, of course they don't require the eugenics movement; they exist independently, right? And there's a different politics that now surrounds a lot of this stuff. But nevertheless, they were the sort of things that the eugenics movement were were interested in, right? Uh, this idea of controlling birth, right? Uh, and uh, because birth is seen as something that in a way is potential capital for the society. And so obviously that's the spirit in which something like The Tissue King is written uh, and, uh, and Wells and, and uh, Huxley um, are in fact, during this period that this, uh, this novel is written, 1926, uh, they are in fact collaborating uh, in a multi-volume uh, work that, that turns out to be incredibly influential in the public intellectual world called The Science of Life. Okay, uh, and it was originally done by subscription, right? Which is to say, you would buy the various installments for this thing, and um, if you and, and if you go to used bookshops, uh, you know, in the in the West at least, um, you know, you can occasionally still find copies of this thing. Uh, it it was on it, it was largely it would begin, I believe, in the late 1920s, and then it carried on into the 1930s. Uh, and, and it really talked, you know, latest developments in genetics, right? It talked a lot about behavioral psychology, uh, you know, and how it would be possible to condition people to do different things and, you know, how this might end up becoming important in psychiatry and, and so forth. I mean, it was very, you know, vanguard, very progressive. And, and the thing about it is... And it also had sections on the environment, I should say, right? So, so it also talked about the human being's place in the world and, and, and uh, thinking about the world as natural resources and that these have to be managed. Um, so it, it's a kind of a very broad sort of uh, account of biology that's very much focused on the human being, right? That, that in a sense, it all, boil, you know, it all ends up at the doorstep of the human being who now needs to do something about all of this kind of knowledge that we have managed to accumulate about evolution and all this other stuff. And, and so it's not shy about talking about how all of this science ought to be applied to society, right? Um, and, and so if you read this, right, you see it's not a million miles. A lot of the things that are being discussed there is not a million miles from the kinds of things that you see in something like The Tissue King. Um, and, and, and I do think that's kind of a, a important, um, thing to keep in mind, right? That, that in a sense, you know, for somebody like Julian Huxley, um, you know, he was very, he, he, he and Wells really got on very well. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, not only because Wells knew Huxley's grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley, um, but, but also because they were sort of on the same wavelength. They were sort of doing the same thing, but one was, you know, Julian Huxley was a proper scientist, you know, and, and, um, and Wells was more of a literary figure. Um, but uh, I think, you know, how to think about Julian Huxley in, in, in this context? Well, I think the first thing is that his, first of all, in terms of the biology of what he does, right? He is actually the person who in the UK wrote the first major work on the evolutionary synthesis. And when we say the evolutionary synthesis, what we mean is the kind of modern way we look at biology, which is to say it's not just kind of the natural history side, right? Darwin's Origin of Species is basically a natural historical work. It's a work about how the various species have come into being over long expanse of time, right, the, through the principle of natural selection. Um, it doesn't really give you a lot of detail about the internal mechanisms by which this has happened. For that, you need genetics. And genetics was a subject that Darwin basically knew nothing about. Uh, and of course, genetics becomes something that gains in prominence and more research in the late 19th and 20th centuries. And so when Huxley writes this book on the evolutionary synthesis in the 1942, um, it's the first of its kind in the UK. Uh, and, and, and so he was seen as this kind of figure who was really on top of all of the science that was going on at the time and was very much interested in seeing where it could go. And that brings the other point about Julian Huxley, which made him very distinctive, even among biologists. And that was, he had this view, 
about human beings, um, which was which in a way was quite uh, above and beyond, you might say, uh, what a strict Darwinist would believe, because he believed. Um, so he and I think Wells as well, and certainly this was true of Wells's teacher and Julian Huxley's grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley. All of these guys are very much preoccupied with um, what makes the human being distinctive, what is exceptional about the human being, given that the more and more we do science, the more a lot of our religious, you know, spiritual ideas get demystified, right? Uh, that there's a sense in which science kind of disenchants the world. And so at the end of the day, is it simply that human beings are just another animal? Right. I mean, certainly this is something, you know, if you read the end of Dr. Moreau, right, that, that this is something that the character is confronting um, and, and it comes up over and over again. Right. In the thinking of all these people. Right. That that that, you know, you know, because what is the future of humanity going to be if as we keep on doing science and we come up with new stuff that we are, in fact, demystifying ourselves. Right. We are showing we're just animals. Right. Um and so it becomes very important to somehow break that. Uh, at least I think this is was very much kind of the uh, agenda of of Wells and Huxley. And I think this is also true of a lot of science fiction people, who uh, you know people who write science fiction today, even right that they are very much struggling with trying to find that kind of transcendent aspect of humanity that goes beyond right the sort of demystified world that we increasingly find ourselves in. And so, uh, for, in the case of Julian Huxley, um, he believed that the key thing was that human beings, human beings do not just obey evolution. They don't just follow evolution blindly like animals do. We actually know evolution, right? We know how it works. We know the theory. And by virtue of that, we are alone among all the creatures, the only ones who can actually steer it direct it, change it, right? That's his idea. So his idea is that you could have directed evolution. This is where eugenics comes back into the picture, right? Because eugenics is directed evolution, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and Huxley thinks that, in fact, this is where humanity demonstrates its uniqueness is in the ability to actually direct the course of evolution, which otherwise would be a blind process. OK, um, and this is a this is an idea that that Huxley never gives up. Right. So Huxley lives. Julian Huxley lives until 1975. OK. Um, and during World War Two, after World War Two. Right. Because, as you know, uh, World War Two was the period when uh, eugenics became this kind of flagship science for the Nazis. And it led to all kinds of atrocities. OK. And uh, and and a lot of the uh, you know the Nuremberg trial right where all these Nazi scientists were were being uh, uh, cross examined by uh, the, the the various uh, Allied judges and lawyers, um, you you saw the extent of the atrocities that were committed in the name of eugenics. Now, at that time, Julian Huxley was the um, scientific director of UNESCO, right? Um, which, you know, is the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And one of the things that he managed to do uh, as the scientific director of UNESCO during this period was to actually enable a lot of uh, the Nazi, uh, the, a lot of the German biologists who were working in the Nazi regime to migrate, right, to the Netherlands, to Britain, United States, right, uh, uh, it, because he was very concerned that uh, what he would regard, what he regarded as an overreaction to Nazi Germany might end up killing genetics, the science of genetics. Okay, um, and um, and so uh, he was, so he never really gave up on this, right? Um, and in fact, in the 1950s, um, Julian Huxley wrote a very very interesting essay where he coined the word transhumanism. It was mentioned in the introduction that I'm someone who uh, works on this topic, uh, and that's certainly true. 
Uh, and, and Julian Huxley is the man who coined the word. Um, and if you look at what he says transhumanism is in the 1950s, it's basically eugenics, I would say. It's, it's the steering of evolution, right, to human ends. Okay? Um, and, and so he doesn't give up on this. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, one of the interesting problems, you might say public relations problems, uh, that uh, transhumanism has today uh, is dealing with the legacy of somebody like Julian Huxley, because it, you know, eugenics is such a dirty word um, th that even though we are in fact talking quite explicitly about intervening in the germline, right, and all kinds of other biotechnologies that are, you know, potentially capable of doing things that not even Huxley could think about, right? Nevertheless, nobody wants to, you know, mention eugenics. Uh, but nevertheless, that is, that is, you know, this, he, he stays on with it and, and toward the ends of his life, you know, so when I was a kid, um, I remember Julian Huxley as a kid, uh, he's an old man by then. And what is he known for when I'm a kid, he is known for being the big champion of in vitro fertilization, right? Test tube babies. Uh, and that was a very controversial thing, but Huxley's there supporting it. Okay, um, now you see all the, now, you, you know, if you're somebody like Julian Huxley, right, if you look, you know, over the course of his life, right, stuff that, you know, in, you know, in his youth would have been discussed as being, you know, science fiction, and he may have written about it as science fiction, um, nevertheless, in the course of his life, right, kind of a lot of it came to pass. A lot of it happened, right? Um, and, and of course, he died in 1975, and that's like almost 50 years ago now. Um, so, so, you know, things... So, so this is where you see kind of the blurring of the line between science and science fiction, right? And, and that, and that it's, it's the distinction ends up being a very kind of conventional thing, right? In other words, it, and when I say conventional, I mean, in a way, arbitrary, right? Uh, because in a sense, while it is true that there are certain things that science fiction authors talk about that we cannot do today, it doesn't follow, right, uh, that, that 20 years from now or 30 years from now or whatever, um, they wa it, it won't be possible. It might well be possible, right? Uh, and, um, and, and so, uh, you know, this is why I think there, that there is an argument to be made, uh, certainly an argument I would make, that there ought to be a very kind of strong and open relationship between science and science fiction. Um, and, and that, uh, in fact, you know, one of the ways in which you want, if you want to get your, your science students to be uh, open-minded about the future of what, might, what their research might hold, um, then science fiction is very good. And, and, um, and I, you know, before, uh, cause I'm going to, I, I want to wrap it up, uh, quite shortly. So to give some time for people to think about what I've been saying. Um, but I think one, just to close on this point, uh, one of the problems with science education is I think, you know, you, you might be aware of, uh, uh, is that it tends to be very, uh, insular, right? Uh, what I mean by insular is it's very much inward looking, um, and, and so we're talking about, you know, people keeping up with what the latest research is and the latest research is defined, usually has been defined quite a long time ago. Uh, and there's certain people in it and it's very well defined. And in a sense, your professional advancement, uh, is very much, uh, dependent on your recognizing this and, and responding accordingly within this relatively narrow framework. Uh, but of course, that's not how the great discoveries get done. Uh, that's not how the great work gets done. Uh, the scientists need to have a much broader horizon. They need to be thinking outside of the confines of their own disciplines and their own research programs. Uh, and they need to be thinking about what the science means for the larger society in the long run. Um, and there are some, this is where you start to project these kinds of futures that in a way, science fiction is very good at opening you up to. And so it's in that spirit that I recommend science fiction. And if you read, you know, the science fiction of the past, like H.G. Wells or Julian Huxley, people like this, right, and you compare it 
right to the science that in a sense they're bouncing off of you know what the what was the science of the day and then this is the science fiction of it you begin to appreciate kind of the imagination that's involved and the way in which they're able to project a future that in many cases is not so different from what came to pass and so even though some of the science fiction from the past looks perhaps a bit old fashioned right you got to compare it with the science they're bouncing off of. And that's what makes science fiction good in a way, is that it can trigger these kinds of potential futures for the research that's already been done on the table. 